This week's episode of the Clear Out podcast was recorded on the 12th of January 2022 at home in Wicklow. And today I am talking about zones, zones and spaces. And I'm talking about entrances and exits. I'm talking about where you're at, where you've been and where you're going. I'm talking about how all of these things are connected to wellness, how we enter different stages of our lives, what colors those experiences, what what residue stays with us from what we've left behind and what we bring into a new space. I talk about liminal zones, transitionary zones. I talk about the understanding of different spaces, different frameworks, different understandings and expectations that belong to different spaces and what happens when those frameworks are broken, subverted, manipulated. What happens when predators enter those spaces? I also talk about rites of passage and how maybe we are never really getting away from that experience of transition, of moving from one stage to the next, and how maybe we need to acknowledge those transitions, how we need to acknowledge our progression, our evolution, our new selves as they emerge at different times in our lives. A rite of passage doesn't just belong in our youth. It belongs in the here and now. That's my argument. Okay, so that's what's coming up. I hope you enjoy it and I will see you there real soon. Ooh, not gonna change my mind. Hi, my name is Dara Clear and you're listening to The Clear Out. Welcome. What an extraordinary couple of days we're having. This beautiful, beautiful spell of weather. Uh, January. January. <laughs> what a gift. <laughs> I've always loved January because it's my birthday month. I, I celebrated a birthday last week and... January, yeah, I just have this positive association with it because, because why? Because I allow myself to feel special on that day. And I like, I like winter. I like this midwinter. I like this Northern Hemisphere midwinter that I'm enjoying again after the period in Melbourne. But yeah, just this great sharpness of light that is illuminating the garden, the trees, the stones, the grass, and blue skies, a few little scuddy clouds around. And there's actually a little bit of heat in that sun. Just enough, just enough. My, uh, my day today started with my morning workout in the garden, in the dark, on frosty grass. I was out there for about 50 minutes or an hour listening to listening to Brett Easton Ellis of all people the the former the former enfant terrible of modern american literature i suppose he had his moment his big moment in the 90s um or was it the late 80s he was a bit of a sensation i've never actually read any of his books but um he, he of course became really Notorious for his book American Psycho, uh, which was made into quite a, yeah, quite an effective film um, 15 years ago or so with uh, Christian Bale in it as the, as the psychopath of the title. And it was a sort of a satire of yuppie-ism, yuppie culture and that Reagan era America, the, the sort of greed is good era um in any case whatever about any of that brett easton ellis has a podcast 
There are free episodes of it out there somewhere, but you can subscribe on Patreon, which I do. And he is, yeah, he's. Re- I find him really interesting. He's um, he's very frank, very open, very honest, and he, his main sort of fascinations and obsessions are movies and books, and um, a certain amount of well a huge amount of self-awareness he's very snipey and critical um and unashamedly himself which is is refreshing in these these careful times we live in someone who's unafraid to say what they think he's very la he's very hollywood he's very socal as they say southern california and he is a very, very much a product of his era, I guess, um, a wealthy L.A. kid. Um, but what he's been doing on his podcast, uh, well, well, I should say what he did on his podcast for much of last year, and I'm trying to think that he even start the previous year, was he serialized uh, a book he had written, uh, which was sort of a work of auto fiction, I suppose, and it was basically his remembrances of a very significant year in his life there was a lot of stuff going on a lot of drama some pretty sinister things went down and it was 1981 he was in his last year of high school and he was basically taking on his podcast he would dedicate the first 50 minutes to an hour of his show to just read the next chapter of the book which is called the shards and i have been listening to it irregularly but i'm back you know i'm back kind of tuning into it and he actually finished it up i think last july or august i don't know what his intentions are he he was he wasn't clear if he was planning to publish or not but there you go so that's what i was listening to in the garden this morning a bit of brett easton ellis's uh book the shards from his podcast which i think is simply called the brett easton ellis podcast and worth checking out at least once if you're interested in uh, in him if you're interested in hollywood if you're interested in his depiction of la in 1981 and the the lives of damaged wealthy children um gadding about in their wayfarers and lacoste tops and being very cool uh yeah quite quite interesting so that was my morning out there in the dark. I came in, I got the house woken up, breakfast, the preschool routine, and then I headed down to the sea for uh, quite a cold swim. Of course, it is it is bloom in January after all. I'm not sure what the temperature was. It was it was cold, not not brutally cold. Um, probably somewhere around the eight and a half mark eight and a half degrees perhaps i was in for about 10 minutes and it was really calm and flat which i love i love sometimes when it's rough it can be a nice distraction from the temperature if it's really cold because you're just busy kind of staying safe and dodging big waves uh but when it's flat and calm and that sun was out ah oh, just bliss bliss um yeah so that was that was the morning i had a few little errands to run and i came home to record this um i was up late-ish last night because i was finishing i was finishing writing a story and then i recorded and uploaded uploaded it to aura the um aura feel my aura aura the meditation and wellness app or the sleep and meditation app i'm not sure how they pitch themselves but um that was good so it was a little productive spell um after the after the sort of downtime of that christmas and new year's period it's time to kick on and get active again and i am on the clock uh, i've got a karate class to teach at four o'clock and my my winter warriors have been rocking up diligently through october november december and now january of a tiny little group of kids who come on different days and do an hour of outdoor karate training this is all real elementary stuff basics and introducing the principles of karate and these are young kids they're only seven or eight so i'm kind of jollying them along but they keep coming back 
um, I'm like so impressed. <laughs> I'm so impressed with them. They're just, they come, they're giddy. They tell me about the stuff that's going on at school. They make jokes, but uh, you know, they, they follow my instruction and they've got their gloves on and their hats and their coats and we train and yeah, it's a, it's a real pleasure. <laughs> So anyway, I've got to I've got to get this done between um, between now and then. So there you are now. There you are. That's that's what's going on. Now, today's ep is I think it's going to be broadly focused on. Is that a contradiction in terms? Broadly focused, <laughs> largely small. Uh, it's going to be broadly focused on. The idea of experiential zones, zones of experience, zones of existence. I suppose what I'm talking about is the places we live. And by that, I don't mean literally the house, the apartment, the castle, the mansion, the cave, the gutter, the garret. I don't mean that although that's in the mix it's not as literal as that i mean where we are existing where the places where we are living at different points of the day at different points of the week at different points in our lives and i'm really interested in this i mean over the last couple of episodes i was talking a bit quite a bit about time and chronology and the unfolding of time and how that can be something that can feel quite oppressive something that can apply an unwelcome pressure to our sense of to our sense of achievement to our sense of wellness to our sense of productivity of success whatever whatever you want to to call it the and maybe the older we get the more that clock seems to tick the louder and faster it seems to get and i think that is something to be resisted resist it please please don't let that clock dictate how you feel don't let that clock dictate how you live that time the time keeping thing the time being aware of time i mean it's useful in terms of the logistics of where I might need to be at what time and to meet whom and what to do and whatever. And I mean, I do, I, I tend to organize my day around that and I fill those hours with different things, but I try not to engage with the great undone. That's a good one, isn't it? What hasn't been done yet? What needs to be done? That can be an overwhelming thing as well. And I just try not to go there. Um, I think that infuriates my wife actually because she likes to plan she likes to have a sense of the structure the strategy the tactics the pathway that is going to lead to future betterness <laughs> future yeah and look it that's a that's a, it's i think it's a it's a very adult and um not inappropriate way to think i'm i'm quite averse to that um i don't that sort of stresses me out so I tend to kind of shift in the other direction and my wife's like come on come on give me a plan what are we doing where are we going where are we heading how are we doing it and that is not unreasonable and I am yeah I am in the as I referred to last week I am in the process of having a good hard look at myself and a good hard look at the way I think about things um, in a bid to in a bid to achieve a better dynamic, um, a better dynamic in that particular area of my relationship, um, because that would help, it would help me and it would help my wife and that's important to me. So anyway, the zones of existence. So if I was talking about time now, I'm sort of talking about not thinking about the chronology, but this sort of idea of what is my experience of the present, wherever that happens to be? And this came into my head a couple of mornings ago, Monday, Monday morning, because my wife and daughter had a little squabble before my daughter had to leave for school. 
and I was to walk my daughter down to the bus stop as I do or you know yeah my wife and I kind of alternate but my wife had got my daughter a pair of new shoes my daughter put them on and she didn't like how they felt and this you know that she she has previous in this area sensitive to the feel of things that's a thing isn't it you know some people are more sensitive than others to how things feel and how clothes feel or a pair of trousers how they feel and my daughter can be quite particular about the the textures of things um, and how they feel on her skin or how they feel on her feet um and you know it, it, you know it's it, it's you know i don't interpret it one way or another i mean she's a very kind of tough robust little character quite rough and tumble um but this is an area where she's like uh, i'm not i'm not happy with how these feel now this was literally there was probably about a minute 90 seconds that was the window that this is the time we need to leave the house this is the time we need to walk down the road to get the bus this is not the time to be trying on new shoes <laughs> I, I could see it playing out i was like oh i you know i i, I don't i try not to sort of <laughs> interfere and yeah it just sort of exploded in my wife's face and there was a big bit of a meltdown and my wife was angry about it she's like i got these you know i got you these shoes they're nice you're gonna bloom and wear them and my wife was angry and yeah and then my daughter's upset and then she puts on this other pair of shoes um that she had been given for christmas that she's been wearing a pair of runners that she has established are very comfortable and off we went and no it was fine it wasn't left on a bad note you know there was a hug a hug from my wife from my daughter and off we went but i could see my daughter was a bit kind of you know grumpy and grant she just wanted to be sort of left alone and off she went to school and that's fine so it was interesting because i i just had this you know i just had this memory i had this memory of our memories of my mother my own mother being an angry mother at times now not not uh, you know I'm, I'm rushing in quickly to <laughs> backpedaling is another way of putting this uh, I'm not trying to suggest a, a connection between my mother and my wife uh, in terms of personality um, but it was more I was like oh yeah I remember having these episodes you know these incidents with my mom or my mother would be just to my mind like irrationally angry and sort of you know furious you know like this escalation of anger that was really unnerving and it happened a couple of times just before school and i remember getting basically kicked out of the car one morning i guess i must have been uh, i can't even remember if i was in secondary school at that time or finishing up primary school it would have been early secondary school you know anyway um if not late primary school but my mother just sort of basically kicking me out of the car um and driving off um you know I, don't get me wrong this was like <laughs> i would have been dropped off at that point anyway to, to to walk down to school but it was like you know there was an you know you're, you're left what you're left with is the feeling of anger and the feeling that you are the cause of the anger and i remember i remember just it like it sucked it felt bloody awful and just sort of you know you just internalize it um and you're sort of processing because you're a kid and you can't quite you don't have the, the the resources the equipment to intellectualize it or rationalize it or get perspective you just feel crap and you know the, the that what i'm remembering was a much you know was a much more extreme example of this quite you know quite a small incident the other morning with my daughter and my wife but it did just get me thinking about this idea so that point of departure from the home this was where the little squabble happened the little you know altercation <laughs> the disagreement um the departure of uh, opinions and what i'm trying to articulate here is that there are zones there are zones there are like there are physical locations where we exist so of course the home is a very 
fundamental, um, you know, kind of base, um, you know, in, in both sense, senses of the word, like, you know, the, the, the place that you return to, the, the, the place from, you know, from which the rest of your life kind of happens out of home. Um, but it's also where you return your base, your headquarters, your sanctum. And hopefully that place is a safe place. Hopefully that is a place with positive associations. Hopefully that's a place that you enjoy opening the door to and entering and being in. And you enjoy that part of your life that takes place in that space where you have your own routines, your own rituals, and within that space, you have your own spaces, you know, bedrooms or studies or whatever, favorite parts of that physical space. Um, and places, places where you are developing a relationship with that environment, where you are building positive and sort of almost symbiotic um, responses and dynamics with certain parts of that place and it might be a chair in the corner it might be a particular window it might be you know it, it could be anywhere it doesn't you know it doesn't really matter like rooms and spaces have energy they have an atmosphere they have a, a dynamic they're not just dead and the home you know where you're where you are growing up if you're a kid where you're living if you're a grown-up that is, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if everyone has this relationship. Like for me, um, you know, coming out of a childhood where I didn't really consider home a safe place that often, uh, it was quite unpredictable. Um, as an adult, I think wherever I've lived independently, and that started from a very young age, I think the, the first independent space I had really was probably the second term of university so I was only kind of just gone 18 and I managed to get a, um, a room to myself in a three-bedroom apartment above a doctor's surgery in, um, in Maynooth in County Kildare where I went to university and I eventually not that long afterwards I managed to get the get the largest room in the apartment because it was a, it was an older sort of postgrad student and he was finishing up and he left what was his name he was a bellew was it eugene eugene bellew <laughs> i'm dragging these memories out of out of where out of storage um but anyway the, i used to really have to take a lot of pride i suppose um and really care about the space i used to care about where i lived i used to care about what i considered my space and i used to very conscientiously or very consciously try to make it as comfortable and hospitable i suppose as as possible and that that continued and has continued over the years um i know when my wife and i first started seeing each other and she came down to 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 pay me a visit she came down for a sleepover <laughs> and I, I was living in a one bedroom apartment in uh, in Wicklow town and I think she was like oh this is surprisingly tidy <laughs> surprisingly tidy and nice and lovely and oh oh look the the CDs are alphabetized <laughs> she's like who, <laughs> who the hell is this guy does he is he is he is uh, is he interested in, in girls? Is he just this, is he a nice little gay boy who is really neat and, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I, 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 you can hear me hesitating because I, I'm always afraid I'm going to sound homophobic or something. But um, in any case, zones, this is the point I'm trying to make. So I created something which was a response to my experiences growing up in a home where I had no power. And that's, you know, that's like, listen, I'm doing psychoanalysis on myself here. Psychoanalysis 101. But it's, it's it, that's only part of the point. What I'm really interested in is entries and exits. Entrances and exits, you know, arrivals and, and leave takings uh, from zones, 
So I was looking at my daughter the other morning and kind of going, okay, so she's had this little spat with my wife. You know, it was a bit emotional. They were both a bit tetchy. And now here's my daughter about to go into the next zone, which is, okay, you can say, okay, well, the next zone is the school bus. The school bus had its own particular energy. If you ever went on a school bus, I think you'll agree, that was a different space. That wasn't school. It wasn't home. Could be quite a volatile, unpredictable space. I definitely had a few incidents on school buses that weren't always pleasant. Um, and so, you know, you, 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 you conduct yourself accordingly. And you get on the bus and you hope no one's going to give you some, give you a crap or try to get a rise out of you. Uh, and similarly, I remember being a, I remember a guy jumping at me one time as I got off the bus because he was a sort of an aggro kind of kid and he was giving me lip. And I think the bus driver had made him sit right up the front. But um, we had a little exchange just as I was getting off the bus and he just launched himself at me. I can't remember if he made it off the bus and we ended up outside. But um, yeah, zones. <laughs> I just want to get off the bus and walk up the hill home uh, where I don't know what will meet me. Um, but my daughter onto the school bus. Now, as far as I know, it's pretty, pretty good bunch of kids uh, on that school bus. And she has very positive things to say about it, about it generally. She's very fond of the bus driver. He's a nice guy. And then into school, another zone. How do you conduct yourself? What's going on? And of course, that could be, you know, any number of things happen when you go into school. Maybe you don't like your teacher. Maybe you're stressed about work. Maybe you're you're having a bloody horrible bullying experience. Who knows? Um, or maybe none of those things are the case. And school is a great place and good for you. And you're very lucky if that's the case. Um, so, yeah, again, this idea of what what meets me what you know what does one meet when one enters a space and this is i think it's really something that is very impactful i think it dictates a lot of you know of how we get on and you know i'm sure i'm sure you know if you, I'm sure you can recall experiences where you're entering a school, where you're entering home, where you're entering, I don't know, you're entering your, you know, your apartment where your, you know, your partner is, which are not getting on. Uh, you're, you're, you're going into work, um, but you haven't got, a, you know, there's something negative happening at work. And what that does to us, like what it does to our sort of, it, it sort of alters our, our chemistry um, for whatever reason, whatever has been triggered whatever has been stimulated um, chemically in our brains, whatever emotions are being stirred, whatever we feel we have to suppress or hide or, you know, or not show uh, or not allow be present, the parts of our personalities that we have to curb or that we have to curtail, that we just have to sort of blunt or dampen. Um, and of course, that would be very appropriate, wouldn't it? <laughs> that would that could be very appropriate depending on where you are but again that just reinforces this idea of different spaces and different zones have different conditions they have different expectations and when you and and that's before you bring in anything interpersonal the interpersonal aspect is when things get messy, when things get tricky, when things get hot, when things get very cold. Who knows? It could be, you know, there could be any number of scenarios that affect that. But what, what I think is it all, it all colors our experience. It all colors this, that, that moment in time, that existing period, it has an impact. And you can, you know, we can, we can pull the camera right out and think chronologically 
I mean, and, and I think this is what many of us do instinctively. We go, oh, well, my childhood was like this. And you take a snapshot of, you know, whatever your earliest memories, three, four, until maybe adolescence, you know, 11, 12, 13, 14. And then that's probably one entire zone of your experience that we can kind of go, oh, that's, that, was, that was what my childhood was like. That was what that experience was like. These are my memories. Those were the, the shaping years of my, yeah, of, of, that, of the person I was going to become. And then you move into that, you know, the adolescent years, the teenage period, where there's tremendous growth and tremendous vulnerability and the the sort of introduction of greater independence, the introduction of greater expectation. And a hugely important part of our lives in terms of where we sort of point ourselves as we enter early adulthood, which is another zone. And there's you know there's a kind of a bleeding of that late teenage period into early adulthood that's pretty messy and unclear and I would argue that there's a lot of vulnerability and uncertainty there as well and depending on you know what your journey was or what your path was whether that was entering the workplace uh, whether that was entering you know university you know whatever it might be you know higher education traveling um, who knows again there's 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 so many different possibilities there but again i think like you know as i said before like you know the lens comes out and you, we're, we're kind of good at this sort of idea of like we divide up the zones of our lives and go oh yeah that was that time oh this was this time and then that was that time and it's another it's another form of this kind of parceling that we do and it contributes it, it, you know this this is a throwback now it calls back to the, the conversations of the last couple of episodes it does contribute to our sense of elapsing time passing time it also contributes again depending on your age it contributes to this sense of of maturation this sense of um accelerating through life or advancing through life um in that temporal sense um but in a way in I, I don't know how useful that is i don't know i mean what do we gain other than you know a, a mathematical division of time and go oh yeah that was then i find it far more interesting to explore well you know what was that experience in that time or what were those experiences you know how did you enter that period like what was the starting point and, and that's what i meant earlier when i talked about you know arrivals and entrances entries how do you enter and you know certainly if we if we want to just jump quickly to the world of of acting the world of the theater you know entrances and exits are cued and timed and they synchronize with the story that's been presented and that's when if you're an actor you know you're 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 you're, you're calibrating your energy in a very particular way just so you can enter with the exact right energy enter at the exact right moment and do whatever you're being asked to do you know whether it's to you know drop your you know your line to do a bit of business whatever it might be to enter that story seamlessly um but life of course isn't scripted life isn't stage directed you know there is no there is no kind of neat point of entry where you can be in total control that's not how it works um and i think from uh i think from i think from a wellness point of view and i think from a sort of a like a, a the, the perspective of of self awareness the a perspective of engaging with a greater level of insight engaging with a greater level of self-possession um, and therefore engaging with a greater sense of control 
a greater sense of power, a greater sense of agency. I think it is really beneficial, really beneficial to be a lot more mindful of, of spaces, of spaces that you're entering. And, you know, there's, there, there are two aspects to this. So let's say spaces, let's also use the word zones as I have done already. I think it's really beneficial to think, oh, okay, so this physical space I'm entering has these people in it and these people have this expectation or this is my history with those people. So what are my expectations going in here? Um, and also you can say, where have I come from? What am I bringing to this point of entry? So as I just mentioned, I'm not coming from a scripted, um, a scripted course of action. I'm not coming with a scripted character backstory. Um, what am I bringing to this moment? I mean, I'm coming with my own backstory. I'm coming with the character that I am. <laughs> that, you know, this is, what, this is what we bring. And so what, but what has happened previously? What, is, what has just happened moments before this point of entry? Where is my head at? Where is my energy? What am I bringing into this space? And then how is it going to interact? So it's almost like a chemical exper experiment. What happens when I put a few drops of this into that test tube and I give it a stir and then I'm going to take this pipette, is it? I'm going to try and drag out some... Uh, <laughs> Old scientific vocabulary from my science classes. Um, what happens if I take this and drop that in and put it into that beaker and put it over that Bunsen burner? What's going to happen then? And what is that strange smell? Um, but that, like, that's that's what happens, isn't it? I mean, that's what we are, like humans. We're like, yeah, there's, there's a there's a volatility. There's a volatility because we are living um, unpredictable beings. And there are so many different things going on under the surface. And that could be different, you know, thought processes, different emotional states, different physical states. Our biochemistry could be in a particular place for all kinds of reasons. Um, and we arrive with that and we go into another space with other people and they've got stuff going on. And then in a way, it's like, how are there not more fireworks? How are there not more conflagrations? How are there not more explosions? How are there not more destroyed laboratories, so to speak? And again, my argument is, if we look at these spaces and zones that we're entering with a tiny bit of forethought, and if we're able to go okay so this is this is how i experience this zone how should i conduct myself to retain more power how should i conduct myself to have a greater feeling of agency how can i conduct myself to survive this experience or how can i conduct myself to maximize this experience how can i conduct myself to have an optimum experience? How can I be more effective? How can I walk away from this experience with the result that I want? Um, and I don't think that's a, I don't think that is a, a, a bad way to go. Now, of course, there are probably many spaces where you feel none of that's necessary, surely. You know, I can just rock up <laughs> and go in and get on with it. Yeah, you can. Of course you can. And that could be a very normal experience in many different situations. But I'm trying to think there are other areas, other zones that are more confronting, that are less comfortable for whatever those reasons might be. Only you can answer that. Um, and the, 
if it hasn't, if it, I haven't articulated it specifically or explicitly, the other zone that I'm referring to is, of course, whatever that zone is in your life at that time, at that point of entry. And that informs what you're bringing into the space. And it also informs the idea of, you know, of, of exiting and of leave taking. What, you know, what is that relationship? Like when you're leaving, is it a sense of relief? Is it a sense of, um, you know, anxiety? Is there, have you already moved on to, oh, now I'm entering this next space, which is going to be a fresh challenge, or this next space is going to be pure respite. It's going to be relief. Um, you know, that's in the mix as well. But the nature of how we experience a lot of these things really depends on where we're at in ourselves at that particular moment in time and that is again that is connected to how we understand ourselves how we see ourselves what level of i just used the phrase a, a moment ago what level of self-possession we're enjoying at that time what level of insight we're enjoying at that time or not because i think when we have a keen sense of how we are um in in you know in an existential sense and that of course relates to you know our you know the 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 present emotional and psychological factors um whatever they may be but when we have a finely tuned sense of that i think what it allows us to do is to manage ourselves with great care and that is not meant to that's not meant to sound like you know, we're, we're good at, you know, molly coddling ourselves or pampering ourselves or becoming really precious about ourselves. That's that's not the direction I'm moving in. But I think the, the, the power and the agency comes from knowing how best to manage our own energy, knowing how best to to utilize ourselves at a particular moment in time knowing how best to to um, dispense or dole out our energy and energy you know (laughs) energy is a it's a finite resource isn't it there's only so much we can do there's only so much we can give there's only so much we can invest and if we have intentions to be sustainable, we need to really manage that energy very well. We need to manage ourselves very well. And that comes back to you know fundamental um, components of self-care, which would be rest and sustenance. So getting the sufficient, getting the sufficient amount of sleep, getting good quality sleep, eating food that is good for our system, good for our brain, good for our body, and being aware that we might benefit from less or more sociability. I don't know. That's again, depends on your personality. It depends on the people who are in your lives. Hopefully you're able to enjoy some exercise of some kind. Again, good for the body, good for the chemicals in the brain. Um, So I find that, or I have found over the years that, you know, bringing that awareness to bear on your situation can yield better results. Um, 
and that of course is really relevant in the workplace it's really relevant in your relationship it's relevant um you know within your family it's i mean in a way you can say well where is it not relevant um because if you are <laughs> if you if you are a person who interacts with other people if you are a relational human being it's going to be relevant how can it not be um and you can go oh well it's okay i mean i don't actually have anything to do with people i spend all my time walking in the woods that's a choice that's a choice and i'm not here to judge you um but even walking in the woods you need to think about that space you need to think about that zone um and indeed there might be there might be one or two people listening to this who had an old walk in the woods before christmas and it didn't quite go as planned did it <laughs> so we we need we <coughs> excuse me i'm sorry we need to think we need to think ahead we need to be aware oh we're going into this zone right i need to i need to manage my resources i need to have a bit of a plan here a bit of a strategy um but anyway that's quite literal that's quite literal i want to come back to the the the, the central idea here zones zones and spaces and existence and where we are at particular times now of course the start of all of this was a little story about my daughter and my wife two very important people to me and you know two people whose well-being i i care about almost as much as my own <laughs> i'd say equal equally equally perhaps more uh, at, at times um but of course my you know my, my daughter being eight years old i and i'm sure i am in no way exceptional in this regard i'm just another parent who wants their child to be happy and wants their growth their development their emerging personality to have every chance it can to to thrive and for for wellness um to be something that is very much accessible for i don't know i mean you know i, I don't actually over analyze this um I'm, I'm just thinking thinking on my feet uh, or thinking in my seat as it happens um that just that specific idea i mean i'm not consciously talking to my daughter ever about wellness um but i would often touch base with her um just to see how she is or particularly i mean as i have spoken about frequently on the podcast you know particularly if i've had a bad experience with her if i feel that i've let myself down as a parent um and you know i feel i need to explain myself i feel i need to apologize i feel i need to really check that she's okay um you know that that that, that is that's really the only response i have if i feel i've i've um oh, i don't know what language to use here i was going to say transgressed but that, that sounds too bloody stuffy and pious um that's not that's not where i come from um but I suppose what I was going to say before, you know, speaking about, you know, my daughter's, you know, emerging personality, her, her experience, I, I think I'm, I am very tuned into, again, speaking of a finite thing, you know, childhood is finite. This experience, this existence my daughter has at the moment, it, it, it's finite. It's not going to, it's not going to last forever. And I think one area one area of major concern I have is around these kind of flashpoints um, where I feel, oh, you know, I lost my temper or I got angry or I'm giving her a hard time. And I think, wow, like it is, will she look back on her childhood and go, oh yeah, no, that was, you know, we lived in a nice place and it was in the country and yeah, yeah, my dad had like a mad temper and, oh, you know, I, you know, I hope I don't end up with a guy like that. That's, you know, you know I'm being... I'm catastrophizing and I'm pretty sure you know there's enough there are enough good things going on and enough good things that pass between myself and my daughter that mitigate 
against that scenario playing out. But it is, it's a genuine fear. It's a genuine tremor of, oh man, how do I pull this back? How do I pull it out of the fire? Um, so it doesn't ultimately become, uh, so, so it doesn't ultimately become a, a, a level of trauma that my daughter will have to unpack later. Um, and again, I, you know, I'm, I, I, you can hear me, hear me stuttering, <laughs> stuttering and stumbling over my defense. Uh, uh, I'd like to represent myself today, Your Honor. Um, I feel uh, I can equip myself uh, sufficiently well in your court. And I'd just like to say I never laid a hand on that child. Um, yeah, look. <sighs> It's just so funny, isn't it? <laughs> Again, I don't think anything really extreme or terrible has ever happened, but I'm just trying to look at it honestly. I'm trying to speak honestly about my own fears. I, obviously, this says a lot more about my own responses to the situation than my daughter's. Um, but yeah, the reason I wanted to focus on my daughter was this idea of stages of development and more than that I'm going to drop in the phrase rites of passage now I only found this out a second ago and I kind of stumbled across it because I was looking up another word I was just checking I was checking the meaning of the word liminal liminal so liminal refers to an in-between state it refers to a transitionary phase or a transitionary zone and i saw a beautiful venn diagram online where basically one uh one circle has no longer as in i am no longer that or that is no longer my state and then the other circle has not yet so i am not yet that which I am going to be. I am not yet this new thing. I am not yet in this new phase of my development. And then the intersection of the Venn diagram is the liminal zone. That's the liminal place. And I think this is a really interesting area of of sort of of of, of human uh, interrelational kind of dynamic when we talk about zones and we talk about liminal zones and in a way that's what I was referring to or that connects to what I was referring to when I talked about entrances and exits how we enter a new place how we leave that place to go to another place they're sort of liminal zones so you're transitioning from one place to the next and I, I remember this came up, I read about it, I came across this idea in an article, a female writer, a journalist, maybe she was a psychologist, I don't know. But it was around the time of a lot of the, the Me Too controversies coming to light, the Harvey Weinstein stuff. Um, and this idea, I suppose there was a lot of discussion about uh, what is and isn't appropriate. Um a lot of discussion around oh well you know that's natural for that type of um lifestyle that sector oh you know show business hollywood you know people do what they must do what they can to get ahead to get an opportunity that's all part and parcel of the business and this writer was to, to my recollection she was talking about you know there are zones where certain behavior is and isn't expected now i don't think that's a difficult concept to grasp so for example if you're an adult and you're going to a bar and you're single you might think oh well this is a zone where maybe i might be approached by a stranger this is a zone where maybe i'll be chatted up or i'll chat someone up there might be flirtation this is a zone that could lead to me being in bed with somebody later on tonight um, and that is accepted that's an accepted framework 
And psychologically, we enter that space thinking, okay, that's a possibility. Now, that probably isn't the framework, that isn't the frame of reference, that isn't part of your expectations when you go to a job interview, for example. That isn't the expectation when you go to get some meat from the butcher, not a euphemism. Um, <laughs> it's not an expectation when you go to school. It's not an expectation when you go to church. It's not an expectation when you go to sports training. And when we hear stories about sexual predation from coaches, teachers, religious figures, movie producers, directors, whatever, they're all transgressing the, the those zones. They're, they're, they're messing with those zones and they're toxifying them and polluting them by going, I've got a different framework to you and my framework is I'm going to take advantage of this situation. And it's instantly, I think from a psychological point of view, that becomes disarming. And I think it does say something to us, uh, or certainly how I'm thinking about it, it says something about how we organize ourselves, like how the human brain and the human social brain organizes itself to recognize, oh, this is, in this space, this thing happens. In that space, that thing happens. And there's a reason I don't put myself in that space because I don't want to participate in that kind of thing. I don't want to be in a space where I might be taken advantage of but this space should be a clean space. I mean, of course, in many cases, it's not even entering your thinking because you're going, I'm here for this. But when a bad actor, and I'm not talking about myself, um, <laughs> I mean someone who's acting in bad faith, when someone enters that space, it, it screws the whole dynamic. It's, it's a subversion. It's uh, a, a betrayal. And I think psychologically, that is, you know, it's, it's a very powerful, um, it's a very powerful tactic. It's a very powerful element because it completely, it completely disarms someone. It completely takes the, the you know, the, 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 the carpet from under them and Again, if we put this into a, a self-defense scenario, this is this is what an aggressor is trying to do. They're trying to put you into a position of disorientation. They're trying to put you into a position where you can't defend yourself. They're trying to disadvantage you and disempower you for whatever end they have. Um, now, self-defense, whatever form of self-defense are martial arts, whatever fighting system you, know, you, know, you may have had experience with, most of them are laying down uh, you know, similar principles of how to deal with that kind of threat. And it is, I think it's the hardest element of self-defense is to train the brain to not be hijacked. It's to train the brain to respond with enormous speed and decisiveness and effectiveness to go, boom, I see what's happening. I'm taking evasive action. I see what's happening. I'm going to counterattack. I see what's happening. I'm not going to get pulled into that framework. I'm not gonna get pulled into that dynamic because then they've got all the power that person the aggressor is dictating what happens next they're laying traps and i'm not going to fall into them but that is the hardest thing to train because we have the adrenaline jump of oh what's happening and that disorientation that ensues um and if we're going to be very cynical Predators are really premeditated. Um, I mean, look, that's a God, that's an enormous generalization. And it's not to say this is what all predators are all attackers. 
uh, do. That I'm, I, I cannot speak to that, and I'm not saying that. I'm categorically not saying that. And this is a bit of a projection. You're going, okay, I'm thinking of someone like Harvey Weinstein. I'm going, do you think Harvey didn't know exactly what he was trying to do when he asked actress X or actress Y to meet him in his office or in his hotel room? Do you think he didn't know well in advance that this was his plan? It wasn't all impulsive and spontaneous. I, you know, that's, that's what I suspect. Um, and so you're putting someone, you're bringing someone out of a safe zone, bringing him into, again, a murky, uncertain zone where the rules are unclear. And, you know, there's a reason, say, Harvey Weinstein said, I oh, know, let's, let's have that meeting in my hotel room. Um, because it's taking someone away from a space where the rules are understood and where the rules are far more clear and where it's much easier to go, well, this is highly inappropriate. Um, so, yeah, that's... That's, that's what I'm saying about that. The zones. And this idea then of a rite of passage. So, okay. A rite of passage, as we understand it, is when I spoke earlier about that was the end of my childhood. So a rite of passage in a very conventional sense. And it wasn't something that I recall happening when I was finishing primary school. But nowadays, primary schools will have a little graduation ceremony. And you'll get a little certificate. And then another rite of passage might be finishing uh, finishing secondary school, high school, and you have your, your Debs uh, or your prom, your coming out ball. And it's an acknowledgement of reaching the end of that level of education, uh, embarking upon a new stage of human experience. Another rite of passage might be you've turned 21, um, in America, of course, turning 16, getting the car, that's a bit of a rite of passage. And that's in, you know, they're the kind of things we think of in terms of um, conventional Western kind of first world experiences, you know, in, in kind of in the modern day. Rite of passage, of course, in the more traditional sense, in the original sense, referred to uh, often you know, indigenous rites of passage, the transition from boyhood to manhood, girlhood to womanhood. And it may have involved taking substances to have a mind altering experience, to go on a journey into the wilderness, to become a man, whatever it might be. Um, I mean, it's been represented in, in movies uh, certainly two that spring to mind very quickly are, are I want to say a man called Horse isn't that the one with Richard Harris the white man who's taken by the American Indians and he goes through what I recall I haven't seen that since I was a kid like a grueling um, extremely you know physically challenging rite of passage so rites of passage often often require the experience of pain the endurance of pain and pain is a great teacher we learn from pain we learn from meeting our limits i mean there you go again like that idea of meeting your limits that speaks to the idea of zones and endpoints as well the other movie that comes to mind is the uh you know the splashy cartoonish high octane uh, <laughs> Greek action movie 300 the you know the 300 warriors that took on the the, the might of um, of is it Cyrus <laughs> the emperor uh, this is one of Zack Snyder's uh, gory highly stylized uh, action movies from gosh are we talking it must be again at least uh, 15 years since that came out maybe a bit more um, Jared Butler as um, oh, I've gone blank on this character's name but uh, yeah he's the leader of, of the the rugged and incredibly ripped finely conditioned Spartans um, but there's a rite of passage there's a rite of passage in that isn't there God, I'm going mad now trying to think of his character's name um, anyway great fun if you like that sort of thing lots of lots of fighting 
Um, so yeah, the, the, the rite of passage. But what I found out there earlier is the rite of passage, that actual phrase was coined by um, a Dutch, <laughs> a, a Dutch, this is, how can you be Dutch, German and French? Oh no, it's Dutch, German, French. Um, a Dutch, German, French ethnographer and folklorist. Now, if you don't know what an ethnographer is, that's an anthropological term. An ethnographer writes an ethnography, so a written account of a people, a distinct people. In, and again, the anthropology, the study of people and cultures. This guy, his name was Arnold van Gennep. I don't know if that's a, that's a G, so I don't know if it's a Gennep or a Genep. In full, Charles Arnold Kerr van Gennep. And he was a Dutch, German, French ethnographer, born in Germany, died in France. And he coined the phrase rite of passage. So he was the first anthropologist to study the significance. I'm quoting here from Wikipedia. The first anthropologist to study the significance of the ceremonies linked to the transitional stages of human life. He coined the term rites of passage, which is still in usage in modern anthropology and sociology. Um, yeah and here you go here's a nice little summary um again i'm just i'm just kind of scrolling here um what are the three stages of rites of passage at their most basic all rites of passage are characterized by three distinct phases separation which is leaving the familiar transition that's the liminal phase that i've been speaking about the liminal zone transition is a time of testing learning and growth and return which is incorporation and reintegration so they're pretty strong ideas separation transition and return the great triplet the power of three the beginning the journey the return and i think that ties in very well with what i'm talking about now i believe i believe many of us hear that phrase rites of passage and we think oh yeah youth youth transitioning to maturation youth to adulthood now my wellness argument is that why in our own minds in our own sense of ourselves can we not apply the idea or allow for the possibility that rites of passage never really end unless you believe that upon entering adulthood which depending again on how old you are that could have been as early as 15 16 like leaving school at a much younger age beginning a job an apprenticeship entering the workplace moving overseas whatever it might be leaving home becoming independent um if you think that was the end of the rite of passage and then you were fully arrived, I don't know what to say to you. I'm like, well, <laughs> well done you. <laughs> or else, my goodness, are you still as interesting as a 15 year old, you know, all these years later? What must you be thinking? What must you be talking about? What must you be feeling? I would maintain that we are endlessly going through new phases and new zones of experience in our lives and okay i know a rite of passage is a prescribed controlled thing it is a, a task a challenge a sequence of events an experience to be endured to acknowledge and mark the transition being completed um are to mark the point of entry and lay out the pathway along which you will travel before exiting into the next phase rites of passage are enormously powerful things because they bestow new status and status amongst your peers amongst your community new status higher status uh, is a hugely powerful thing it commands greater influence, greater respect, greater acceptance, 
a different type of expectation, a different type of understanding. And surely, surely that is something that we quite desire on some level. Now, I'm not, I'm not advocating that we need to do something performative or demonstrated for our community and then to bask in the glory of arrival. That might not be that sustainable. People might go, oh my God, here he goes again. What's he doing this week? Oh Jesus, he's going to climb that tree and jump off. Oh marvellous. Someone call an ambulance. I'm not advocating anything like that. However, I think I am advocating acknowledging yourself, demonstrating something to yourself, bringing that awareness to bear on, oh, I have been through something. Oh, I am about to start something. Oh, I've arrived at this point and this is a different place. I wasn't in this place a certain period of time ago. I don't think that necessarily stops happening to us. And I think it is enormously beneficial to step outside and to see ourselves and to go, okay, this is new. This is a new thing. And I'm bringing new experiences to bear. And this is part of my ongoing evolution, development, struggle, overcoming, resolution. And that idea again, you know, the, the, the reintegration, the incorporation of what one has learned, the incorporation of what one has been through and how does that now inform your, your continuing progress? How does it inform the continuation of your journey? How does it inform your decision making? How does it inform your relating? How does it inform how you relate to yourself? I think that's good stuff. I think that is no less relevant now than when you were, uh, uh, you know, if you were like me, a completely clueless, um, you know, adolescent or a completely clueless 23 year old or a completely clueless 31 year old or whatever. Um, change, change happens, change happens. And sometimes it is very worthwhile to acknowledge acknowledge what we have passed through i think that's what i'm saying and acknowledge that the liminal place the liminal place is a place of of vulnerability and so if you think of it that way the decision to embark on a new journey is an agreement to enter into a vulnerable place the agreement to enter into a place of transition where there will be a feeling of uncertainty, where there will be unknowns, where there might be fear, there might be anxiety, but you've been brave to step into that zone and then to emerge on the other side of that, to have had an experience, to have survived the experience. I don't know. I'd be in favour of giving yourself a pat on the back. I'd be in favour of acknowledging that to yourself in some way. And you can share it with somebody else if you like. Why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you want to? You don't have to. It might be something very private and that's okay too. Um, I just want to finish today's episode to by, by acknowledging uh, Sinead O'Connor's loss. She lost her son to, to suicide last week. Um, a young man, he was only 17, um, uh, I think he was he was Donald Lunny's son also. I just think it's so sad. He he Yeah, it was this kind of beautiful looking kid. Uh I wasn't really aware of any of his backstory. Apparently he'd had some very serious mental health issues and his mother, Sinead, the the singer, she's kind of an icon really. I've always had an enormous I've always had enormous um affection for Sinead O'Connor. Um she's had a messy life and she's been very messy at times but I feel she's always been a voice of truth um, even though she's tried on a lot of different hats um, she's always kind of been out there and 
very messily authentic sometimes misguided sometimes lost sometimes clearly um a person in a lot of pain and distress and yet i still i still see her as someone i find her quite inspiring in many ways and i just i don't know my heart breaks for her at the moment what a horrendous loss she was appealing to her son on social media not to do anything to himself and it all came to pass quite quickly it seemed over over a couple of days and she has been in the media subsequently expressing her her anger at institutions and then she's apologized for that anger and it's just a it's a terrible thing and i don't know i i just found myself asking you know what what can we do really i mean there must be more we can do to to create something culturally something in our national psyche in our in our in our sort of national sensibility that makes vulnerable people regardless of their age i mean being a teenager that age is particularly you know that's that zone that liminal zone leaving adolescence entering adulthood it's a can be a very fraught time but it's not just young men who kill themselves you know and it's not just you know it's women it's everyone it's whoever you know old people young people you know suicide self-harm the urge to self-destruction the sense of the sense of having no other choices the sense of being overwhelmed i mean you know i i can definitely i can relate to it there are aspects of my own depressive episodes that certainly go to that place even still um I've, i'm lucky that i've I've developed pretty good strategies to cope with that and not act out. Um, but I think, as I say, it, it's something I feel I, I have quite a bit of insight into. Um, and yeah, I just think it's 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 just a terrible it's a terrible tragedy. It's a terrible loss, and I don't know. I don't know what the answer is to to help us talk more about it to help us feel um there are avenues to express our fear our sadness our darkness that we can cultivate cultivate something culturally socially across you know across all sectors that makes people feel there's a safe there's a safe space there's a safe safe space to express this version of myself there's a safe space to to unload there's a safe space to be completely broken um and i'll be supported um and i'm not going to be condemned or or judged for this um i don't you know it's not as simplistic as that there are other aspects of course to anyone's suffering but yeah i just um my thoughts and my heart is with with that family and the people connected to that you know that beautiful young man and how terrible it is that that he's gone and and yeah my sympathies to anyone who's had to come into contact with that that experience um not 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 not, not that specific one Sinead O'Connor's son but in in a general sense um maybe all of us have been touched in some way by stories like that so there you go let's um i don't know let's do better let's let's contribute to something better if we can let's not be afraid to put our hands up and go this is what i think i'm gonna leave you there and um yeah sorry to t- maybe I, I, no i'm not gonna apologize this is important stuff this is important stuff it's it's worth talking about we shouldn't be afraid of it and we shouldn't be afraid to allow ourselves to feel things um, and we shouldn't be allow, afraid to allow ourselves to dwell on these areas of loss. It's a, it's a loss to us all when someone takes that choice. It's, um, you know, it's a wound. It's a wound in ways we're, we're all responsible for in some way um, if we care about our, our fellow travellers on this, on this earth. So there you go. I'll leave it at that. Listen. As always, thank you so much for listening to the show. I hope you're getting something from it. And I hope you're in a good place right now. And I hope this winter and these bright January days, um, in Ireland anyway, are doing something for you. Or those 
bloody hot summer days in Australia if you're listening from there or wherever. Um, be well, be positive, stay safe. You can, of course, uh, find me on social media. The Clear Out Podcast is on Instagram. It's on YouTube. It's on Facebook. The Clear Out 2 is on Twitter. And you can email me, if you so desire, at theclearoutlive at gmail.com. And if you like the show and want to contribute to its longevity, uh, you can contribute financially via the supporter link, uh, wherever you're listening to the podcast, or you can use the Patreon link. That's patreon.com, the clear out. So there you go. Okay. Thanks for listening. All the best. Mind yourselves. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.